Cannabis Common Sense, the show that tells the truth about marijuana and the politics behind its prohibition. Hello and welcome to another exciting edition of Cannabis Common Sense. We have a very interesting show for you lined up tonight. Right next door to me is Mr. Anthony Taylor. Welcome back, Anthony. Anthony is on the newly formed Oregon Cannabis Commission that's supposed to advise the Oregon Liquor Control Commission about medical marijuana. And he's also the uh, founder and director of Compassionate Oregonians, an Oregon medical marijuana patient group. Standing by in the wings, we have John Crenette. Welcome back, John. Thank you. Ready to... Like Anthony says, restore our 24. This is nonsense. They're trying to chip away at all our medicine. This sad. Indeed. Well, we have a, uh, a hearing coming up well, in front of the OLCC next Wednesday, but we'll be talking more about that in just a few moments. But first, we're going to bring out our infamous dancing cannabis leaves. I feel the force. First story tonight is a legislative roundup. The United States House Judiciary Committee approved legislation, H.R. 5634, the Medical Cannabis Research Act of 2018, to facilitate federally approved clinical trials assessing the efficacy of whole plant cannabis. The vote marks the first time that lawmakers have ever decided in favor of easing existing federal restrictions, which limit investigators' ability to study clinically marijuana in a manner similar to other controlled substances. U.S. Senator Dianne Feinstein, Democrat from California, one of Congress's more ardent drug warriors, signed on to co-sponsor the States Act to remove the threat of federal intervention and prosecution in states that regulate marijuana use and sales. At the state level, New Mexico's health secretary approved adding obstructive sleep apnea as a medical cannabis qualifying condition, but rejected adding opioid addiction, muscular dystrophy, Tourette syndrome, eczema, and psoriasis. Separately, New Mexico regulators are holding a series of public meetings next month to receive feedback of proposed hemp rules. In Vermont, Marijuana's Legalization Study Committee and the legislature held a meeting, and in California, Governor Jerry Brown signed a bill prohibiting the marketing of cannabis products on websites used by minors. Our next story tonight is from London in the United Kingdom. Cannabis smoke exposure, even long term, is not positively associated with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or COPD, lung cancer, or irreversible airway damage, according to a literature review published in the journal Breathe. British researchers reviewed nearly 20 observational studies assessing cannabis inhalation and lung health involving over 25,000 subjects. The investigators reported that the available literature fails to support an association between cannabis smoke exposure and the onset of COPD, emphysema, lung uh, cancer, shortness of breath, or irreversible airway damage. The authors concluded, quote, the long-term respiratory effects of cannabis differ from traditional smoking. Cannabis smoking does not appear to be carcinogenic. The researchers did identify a link between marijuana inhalation and more frequent cough, sputum production, wheezing, and chronic bronchitis, <coughs> though they acknowledged that these symptoms largely ceased upon quitting. The authors also acknowledged that uh, vaporizing cannabis, a process which activates cannabinoids and vaporizes them without burning cannabis or the combustion byproducts associated with smoking, but does not heat to the point of combustion, 
reduces many of the symptoms. The study's findings are similar to those of others reporting that cannabis smoke and tobacco smoke differ significantly in their health effects and that smoke exposure is not associated with poor lung health. The full text of this study, Marijuana and the Lung, Hysteria or Cause for Concern, appears in this month's edition of Breathe. Out of Washington, D.C., lawmakers have removed language from pending federal legislation that sought to facilitate veterans' access to medical cannabis in jurisdictions that regulate it. Under existing federal regulations, physicians affiliated with the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs are prohibited from filling out the necessary paperwork required in legal medical marijuana states. A budgetary amendment included in the Senate's version of the Military Construction, Veterans Affairs, and Related Agencies Appropriations Bill sought to end this prohibition. However, congressional leaders on Tuesday voted to eliminate the provisions during hearings to reconcile the House and Senate versions of the bill. United States Congresswoman Tulsi Gubbard of Hawaii, uh, who is a veteran herself, said, quote, our veterans put their lives on the line for our country and many come home dealing with visible and invisible wounds. Con to continue limiting their access to quality health care through the VA is a disservice to them and the sacrifices they've made, end quote. Similar language was included by both chambers in the 2016 version of the full funding bill, but was stripped from the text during meetings in conference committee. Last week, Senators Bill Nelson of Florida and Brian Sanchez of Hawaii for the first time introduced standalone Senate legislation to expand medical cannabis access to military veterans. Similar legislation also remains pending in the House. The 2017 American Legion poll found that nearly one in four veterans use marijuana to alleviate a medical condition. Our next story is out of Brooklyn, New York. Brooklyn District Attorney Aaron Gonzalez on Friday last week publicly acknowledged his intent to vacate over 10,000 low-level marijuana convictions. Those state lawmakers decriminalized minor marijuana possession offenses in 1977, possessing small amounts of cannabis in public view remains a criminal misdemeanor. City police have made several hundred thousand arrests since the late 1990s for violation of the public use statute, primarily due to aggressive stop and frisk policing. Over 80% of those arrested were either black or Latino. Under the new initiative, those with low level convictions will be eligible to have their criminal records vacated beginning September 21st. Couple, well, just next week. Prosecutors estimated that the effort may ultimately result in the expungement of some 20,000 past convictions. Earlier this year, DA Gonzalez, along with Manhattan DA Cyrus Vance Jr., declared that their offices would no longer prosecute low-level marijuana offenses. Uh, they said, quote, it's a little unfair to say we're no longer prosecuting these cases, but have these folks carry these convictions for the rest of their life, end quote, Gonzalez told the Associated Press. This week, CNN reported that Vance's office has dismissed over 3,000 low-level cases, including some ba dating back to the late 1970s. In recent months, district attorneys in a number of metropolitan areas such as San Francisco and Seattle have begun the process of reviewing and vacating past low-level marijuana convictions. Lawmakers in several states, including Delaware, Massachusetts, Maryland, Oregon, and Rhode Island, have enacted expungement laws following the passage of either marijuana decriminalization or legalization. In California, legislation providing for mandatory expungement of past marijuana convictions is awaiting the governor's signature. He's likely to sign. An estimated 220,000 cases would be eligible for erasure or reduction under the proposed California law. Next story is from Canada. Consumers generally believe that cannabis sold in legal markets is superior to that available on the black market and are willing to pay a premium for it, according to data published in the journal Addiction. Investigators from Canada and the United States assessed adults' opinions to the impact of cannabis pricing on their own purchasing habits. The researchers reported that most consumers perceive legal cannabis to be of greater quality and that the advent of legal marijuana markets reduces consumer demand for black market products. The authors also reported that most consumers will pay a premium price for legal cannabis. In uh, Canada, that's up to approximately 14 Canadian dollars per gram, but warned that excessive pricing can induce customers to return to the illicit market. The study concluded, quote, this study provides empirical evidence that cannabis is 
uh, treat and treating legal as a superior commodity compared to illegal cannabis and exhibits uh, asymmetric sustainability that supports the use of price policy uh, in uh, their costs. These findings suggest that availability of legal cannabis does not incentivize or expand the illegal cannabis market unless the price of the legal product is too high. Pricing policy will need to be optimized to maximize the benefits of the legally regulated cannabis marketplace. The findings are similar to those published uh, in July, which concluded, quote, the introduction of illegal cannabis into the market may disrupt and reduce illegal purchases. End quote. This study, Price Elasticity of Illegal versus Legal Cannabis, a Behavioral Economic Sustainability Analysis, appears in this month's edition of Addiction. Next story is out of San Francisco. Approximately one in seven adults acknowledge having consumed cannabis within the past year, according to data published in the Annals of Internal Medicine. A team of investigators from the University of California and Columbia University in New York assessed cannabis use patterns in a nationally representative sample of 16,280 U.S. adults. Overall, 14.6% of the respondents said they had used cannabis. And that is the end of our hemp news segment for tonight. And Mr. John Cornett is ready to play some music. Uh, Welcome, yes, sir, John. I am here, and there goes the water again. <laughs> I just built my water again. Hey, it's cool. This has been a good day. I wasn't going to make it up here today because I was feeling pretty bad. Um, but it was important to come here and sing this song for you guys because I want to sing about, uh, I was saying about this before, this is an important love of mine. I think we all like it. Like her, love her. Her name is Mary Jane. Thank you, John. 
We had a couple little technical difficulties there in our newscast, but uh, hey, we managed through it there. Welcome back to the show, Anthony. Thank you, Paul. How are you doing? I'm I mean, good. when How I came you? here in 1984, you were already active in the marijuana legalization movement here in Oregon. I'd been active in, in Washington State for a while and back well, east before that. I like to think of it more as reactive uh -huh. <laughs> because uh, it certainly, uh, the cannabis laws in those days certainly needed uh, addressed and, um, you know, we went through a couple of decades where they weren't very nice to us. You and, know, uh, it looked like at the end of the 70s until the advent of Ronald Reagan and the Just Say No campaign that marijuana legalization was on the horizon. It had been decriminalization in a number of states, starting here in Oregon in 1973, Absolutely. right after the unsuccessful initiative in California in 1972. But, and, and I think about 10 or 12 states decriminalized there in the 70s right. until there was feedback and the, uh, the drug czar for President Carter kind of had some, some negative publicity around a couple of events that don't need to be rehashed here right now. <laughs> But uh, rehash being the operative word. That, that's a good one, isn't it? It's, uh, <laughs> pardon the pun. But uh, anyway, we went to work, and you and I, and John Sajo, and Fred Orther, and Greg Mahalik, and, and many others who will go on name. Louis Montano. Louis got more signatures on <laughs> that than name. anybody else. I, I got about a thousand signatures myself, and organized about another seven or eight thousand. But we made the ballot quicker than any other initiative in state history way That's back right. when. It still has. It's a record that hasn't been broken. Our well, and we were lucky because John and I worked in the legislature in 85 and got an early turn-in law mm -hmm, put in place mm -hmm, so that mm -hmm. we didn't have to, we could wait. Anytime we had the signatures, we could turn them in for verification. Mm -hmm. And it gave us, what, four or five month jump on our campaign. Yeah, so yeah. or even more. I mean, we turned in our signatures in uh, the 1st of November yeah. of 1985 for a vote in... 86. 86, but uh, the so turn-in would have been early... July. July. Yes, so exactly. it gave us about seven months, yeah, I think. Yeah. Seven. Or eight. Eight months. And that was a struggle because yeah. the um Then the whole federal government came down and cracked Exactly. Down on the us. media wouldn't sell us any campaign time. Vice no President time. Bush, who was the drug czar, came in February of eighty six and toured the state. There's some video feedback. Uh, here I come with a flag waving, bringing in a <laughs> case of uh petition sheets, signatures. Yeah. There's Louie and John. We always get a chance. It's good to this is the video from the turn in on November 1st, 1985. You know, when we opened that uh, case full of signature petitions. There, there I am. Right there, there you are. We <laughs> found Bryce there was Garner. about an ounce of cannabis in there. And uh, <laughs> we had to kind of hide that a little bit. But then we went outside <coughs> and smoked it after the, the uh, Jack Hare in the back. There's Laird Jack Punk. Hare. Bryce Garner right there. Yeah, yeah. But now we are at work trying to defend medical marijuana patients and create a real legal marketplace, which absolutely. is what we were trying to do there back a long, long time ago. Yeah, absolutely. And, but uh, there have been some setbacks and some, some, some wins and some losses. Absolutely. And perhaps one of the bigger losses for medical patients happened a few weeks ago when they cut the amount of cannabis that a, an Oregon medical marijuana patient permit holder can purchase at a uh, at any one an time CC dispensary I think yeah. there's only five just medical dispensaries currently licensed and I've been told only one of those still has their door open I'm not sure well I, my understanding is that the one in Sherwood and their name escapes me otherwise I'd plug it but the one in Sherwood and the one in K Falls um, mm -hmm. are the only ones that are only actively two. So running are as medical only so if you need 24 ounces those are you the can go to those two <laughs> But uh, now, you know, you started Compassionate Oregonians back in 2013. I know you'd been lobbying for right. a number of years on behalf of medical patients there. But uh, then you were instrumental, I think, in the formation during the 2016 legislative session of this new Oregon Cannabis Commission. Right. That was actually in 2017. Uh-huh. Okay. And that we brought... Created. Yeah. Yes, we brought the uh, legislation initially uh, to Representative Buckley at the time, mm -hmm. uh, who had actually also introduced uh, our patient rights bill mm -hmm. uh, that died in committee. Um, so anyway, uh, but uh, Representative Buckley was not going to be there in the fall, so we needed somebody to introduce the bill for us. So Andy Olson stepped forward mm -hmm. and got. Well, he's the a Republican. Isn't yes. He? 
<laughs> kind of a nemesis of the earlier yeah, cannabis he crowd. Was. So, I remember that. And he um, worked with Ann Leininger, and they introduced it as a committee bill. Mm -hmm. It had some stumbles. Mm -hmm. It didn't come out of the chute very well. Um, not to get into that too too far, but in the end, we created the Oregon Cannabis Commission, mm -hmm. and they met for the first time in the first week of December and have been meeting every other month since. Mm -hmm. uh, and they have established uh, four subcommittees that deal with research, product integrity, training, and education of healthcare professionals, and then patient access. Uh, which I am the chair of that subcommittee, Patient Access Subcommittee, and that's probably uh, the one with the most work to be done because the, the statute allows that this commission is supposed to evaluate the program. For the OLCC? No, for the OHA. For the OHA. So do you have and any input make, at the OLCC? Well, we have authority to advise, mm -hmm. but our main thing is to make adjustments as needed to the program to make it better for patients and then to create a long-term strategic plan to make sure that cannabis is available and affordable for those that find benefit from it. Mm -hmm. So those are our big goals um, and uh, boy patient access it's a tricky one but more importantly um, OLCC flex their muscles, as you alluded to earlier, uh, and restricted. And they didn't notify anyone. I know you're on the Oregon Cannabis Commission, and, and I think you told me here recently that they didn't even tell the Oregon Health Authority that this was happening. And they didn't notify the Oregon Cannabis Commission either. And the Oregon Cannabis Commission is statutorily allowed to provide advice to the mm -hmm. OLCC and OHA, but to the OLCC specifically as changes relate to patients and this is a prime example of you know this so we passed ballot measure 91 with a clause several clauses more than one clause that said the medical marijuana law would not be changed well we've off obviously been sold out you know i've lived here in oregon now for more than 30 years and i can tell you that it has been held as sacred that an initiative law passed by the voters will not be altered by the legislature. Well, they've thrown that out the window when it comes to marijuana laws. Now, some say they are uh, responding to the federal government, and I think they are, but unnecessarily so. Oh, absolutely. Because Especially the federal government's case. law, the Controlled Substances Act, uh, says explicitly, that's Title 21 of the United States Code, at section 903 that state law takes precedence. So you know, several years back, probably a decade ago, the Oregon Health Authority started printing on the side of our permits that this does not protect you from federal law. Well, that has always irked me because this does protect you from federal law. Yeah. They are wrong and that shouldn't be on those permits. Right. You know, and they're just ignorant because they don't know about section 903 of the Controlled Substances Act. Yeah. Well, and we find that to be the case. I walked into a dispensary one time that had a sign above the door going into the actual dispensary that said, cell phones not allowed in the dispensaries. And I said, what's up with that? that well, that's the law. <laughs> well, no, it's not. Those minimum wage workers <laughs> in those dispensaries don't really know. They just do right. what they're... Their right. bosses tell them, I guess. They pa are asked a few questions on their marijuana workers permit uh, mm -hmm. test and um, their issues. Using cell phones is not one of them, I'm sure. <laughs> so well, you, so anyway, they stumble. But it, uh, so on Wednesday, the OLCC is going to have a rules advisory committee hearing. Their first one. Their first on one. On this change to patients to limit them from 24 ounces, which is what it has been since the medical marijuana law dispensaries open. Yes, absolutely. And uh, down to one ounce, which for me personally, that really doesn't affect me because I don't buy in dispensaries. I've only, I went in and bought three joints on the day recreational became legal, and I haven't gone back in to buy any more because right. I have more than enough of several different kinds that I grow myself, well, and, and I know there's no poison on it. But I know that that has a very negative effect on a lot of uh, disabled patients, especially, that have to oh, travel absolutely. a long way to one of these absolutely. dispensaries. 
uh, especially those out in eastern Oregon. Oh, absolutely. And it doesn't matter if it's in eastern Oregon and you have to drive from Lakeview into Klamath Falls or mm -hmm. Burns to get your cannabis. It matters that the OLCC shouldn't be in charge of limiting patient access by restricting sales to them in their stores. They've closed down the stores that we use. They've virtually eliminated all but about 800 of the medical growers that are growing for other patients. We have no options except to go to the black market. And we all want to avoid that. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and, and because of those changes, the patients are forced into these stores and now cannabis is less in cost so they can buy larger amounts. So, yes, maybe only 95 percent of the patients, are, well, 95 percent of the patients, according to their statistics, are buying less than an ounce when they go into the stores. Mm -hmm. um, but some of them well, they come knew in that for it was more. only a few people. Correct. Who were abusing this. I mean, it right. wasn't very many people who were no. going in and buying 24 ounces even once, no less, multiple times right. in a day, which was what they said right. was the issue. And the other thing that Why they, didn't they go after just those patients? And the stores of that sold it to them. All of the patients. They're trying to end the medical program. Do you get that, in, that feeling <laughs> that the OLCC <coughs> wants to stop medical growers and to put everything under their control? No, I don't think they're going to go that far, but I do think they are uh, have a concerted effort to eliminate the multiple patient growth sites, which I call mm -hmm. the MPGs. Which is really how patients are, are able That's to right. get it low cost is, cannabis. It is I have been main... growing and giving away free cannabis. I've given away personally over 6,000 pounds since 1999. Yeah. Yeah. And if and so I didn't have multiple just... licenses, I wouldn't have been able to do that. Right. And they're trying to dismantle that aspect, the most important aspect of the medical cannabis program. And the sad part is they'll leave the card program intact and they'll say, no, we have a medical program. Mm -hmm. You can get a card anytime you want. If it you just qualify. doesn't make any difference. But you, you, can't me you can't designate a grower anymore because we've eliminated multiple patient growth sites. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and it goes back to the whack-a-mole theory. They just don't have a, any understanding of how it works on the ground how the grower patient relationship works. So we're going to get a chance to talk about this on Wednesday. And so you are right. This, this hearing at the OLCC, which is on McLaughlin near Milwaukee, but inside the Portland city limits. Right. Right there. What is that? Highway 226 or 223 or something like that. One of those there. numbers there. It's right there where that highway well, there's meets three or four McLaughlin. Of them that come together. Actually, I know they there, do. So. They do. But anyway, it's the, Oregon Liquor Control Commission's headquarters, yes. which is uh, on the west side of McLaughlin and the east bank of the Willamette River. Yes. Uh, and you can get to it right off of McLaughlin going south. Yeah. Um, you can get to it coming through Selwood and hitting 17 down through the back way also. Mm -hmm. Then um, you have to cross a bridge over to, to circle back right. if you're going so, northbound on McLaughlin. And, and we want to get as many patients out there as we can. Now, there, some will be able to be in the room because it'll hold 30, or 30 people or so. Mm -hmm. But we'd like to see a large turnout, a couple hundred patients if we can. Mm -hmm. And Compassionate Oregon's working on this, and we are working with other groups to bring mm -hmm. patients in also. Like uh, this TV show? Yeah, like this TV show, which I'm uh, happy So to will be there be now. a chance for patients to speak? Is there going to be like a sign-up for patients to speak? I know this hearing is only from... 9 to 12, so it's a very narrow window there. Actually, it's 9.30 to 11.30. Oh. And typically, they will give uh, room for public comment at the end. I see, I see. Um, but I think it's more important that we have as many patients outside as possible because we're going to issue press releases. Uh, and if we have patients out there, you know, doing With signs. The, you should have marks. signs. Here's a yep. little uh, image you sent me that talks about the yep. event coming up. Uh, so it is there. Their address is on there. Oh no, that's the one for uh, Eugene. There's well, also the going to be one in Eugene yeah. on October fourth. Right. That's There's correct. another one that another image you prepared that shows for the 19th. There it is. Well, I think. No, go back to the other one. Go back to the other one. The middle white block. OLCC ah. meeting. Okay. September 19th. That screen's nine to noon. Away. Gotta focus my tri. Oh, oh your tri. <laughs> Uh, so they're going to be discussing the one ounce limit for patients, and I think we have them. I think we have the advantage mm -hmm. because they know they messed up, mm -hmm. and when people know they messed up, they want to. What do you think they're going to do? Any guess? Yep. 
I have a strong feeling that they will rescind the rule limiting mm -hmm. to one ounce. They'll restore the 24 ounce limit and then limit the frequency of purchases. Well, that makes sense. I that mean, makes sense. That's a good I don't need solace. more than 24 ounces in a day myself. Right. I think 24 ounces. Well, and ounces then the, the other thing, Paul, that they didn't say is that they have no way of telling if the consumer market is doing the same thing one ounce at a time instead of 24 ounces well, at a time. I think it is. I think it is. Oh, absolutely. You know, uh, you Probably. know, there's a, and, and they're not going around to the stores and buying 24 ounces, but they are going around to a few stores before they head back to Des Moines or Indianapolis or wherever they might be I think from. that's mostly for personal use. Right, though. and they'll it's take not like a, four, five, six ounces, whatever yeah. they feel comfortable with yeah. getting on the plane with. Um, mm -hmm. And that happens all the time. And, and um, but my point is, is whether that's okay or not, and however we address it, they have no way of looking at those numbers. Um, they can only look at medical numbers because they keep those for 30 days. Yeah, and and the recreational numbers are destroyed in, what is it, 24 hours? They don't even keep them that long. They don't long. keep them anymore. They don't keep them. Um, they did at first, but at then first, they ruled they couldn't. And then they ruled they couldn't, and they were going to limit it to 24. I think it ended up at 72. But the medical ones have to be kept for 30 days initially because... The medical reporting system ran on a 30-day cycle yeah. rather than an activity-based cycle, which mm -hmm. if you had 12 activities that day, you had to enter them all. Mm -hmm. You didn't wait until the 10th. <laughs> well, I understand now if someone has to transfer marijuana to a patient, for instance, if I was going on the metric tracking system, take marijuana to a patient, which I do still, I have to first register that I'm going to take it to the patient. Then I have to register that I am, in fact, leaving and in transit. And then I have to register again that I have delivered it. So and, that is three transactions. And just when you get me. back, you have to register that you returned. Oh. And you're only allowed a 12-hour out and back. Oh. So, for instance, if you were delivering, doing the I-5 corridor, mm -hmm. you could only do it about half at a time because you got to be back to the store by, within 12 hours. And you have to have all Why kinds of... Why do we have this crazy... It's all Idiocy. about diversion, and this is what we're going to see in this legislative session. So I want every one of you to pay attention. Instead of saying, what about the children? They're going to say, overproduction and diversion, and everything will be done under that guise, well, under that cover. I know that's cover. something that, that you've been addressing. We're going to go to it. Now, we are taking questions. If, if someone out there is watching, they can uh, call in at the number... 503-288-4448. That's 503-288-4442. There it is on your screen. 503-288-4442. We are taking viewer phone calls and questions. And we have a studio audience and a microphone here that uh, we've got a couple people lining up to ask probably you some questions here. You're so the go expert. Right, go right ahead. This is John <laughs> Cornett, our our. Bar. Hi, John. How are you this evening? Hey, Anthony. I just have a, a, one big question I think is very important because uh, I don't hear it getting asked. And, you know, we keep going around in circles about come over here and hold a sign and do this and that. But where is the legal representation where we get to sue the people, the individuals or the groups, whoever it is that is the source of this idiocy, contra, you know, going against uh, what we voted, which is not to mess with the Oregon Medical Marijuana Program? This is insane because of our lack of, we can't, are we that stone that we can't get it together and pay no, some attorneys? No, we're just no. that poor because we can't that, go okay, in that, and that, hire an attorney to do this. That is it's not, not fair. fair. It's that not is, fair. So. That is not fair and it's got to stop. Well, that's the way, unfortunately. Is anybody filing any lawsuits at all? No, we don't have the money. We're is poor that all it is, just money? We're poor patients. You've got to be yes. kidding me. No. Well, yeah, we everybody have, no, has to suffer because we can't pay somebody. John, there are, wait, well, God. that's why wait, my John, company John, John, was wait, stolen. Let me, let me address this. Because I can't quick. afford a lawyer. Because there them. are a number of attorneys that will donate their time to help us do stuff. Well, wait a second. Well, let me finish. Let, let, me, let me finish. But then the, then the axe falls because we have to fund their research crew, the filing fees, and all that sort of stuff. Yes, a bit of money. So but where that no, that's people, my that, that's the, the job. Have, who, who, where are the people? Wait where are the patients? Somebody out there's got wait, some money. Wait. Help us, please. Yes, please do help us. 
Uh, and that is a good point. It's, it is hard for uh, patients to come together and raise any money. Uh, Compassionate Oregon is a nonprofit organization with an all-volunteer board. We've been so that way. So you have your 501c3 status? We have C4 status. Oh, okay. So because C3 team. doesn't allow us to Lobby. do a lobbying and yeah, stuff. That's right. It allows you to, to deduct your contribution. Right. Right. But it doesn't allow us to do the lobbying. Political but activity. with the four, we can do lobbying education, yeah. but you can't deduct your contribution. Yeah, so. I, I'm familiar with those rules. Yeah. Uh, Judy has a question. Go ahead, Judy. Um, yeah, a question, a um, comment. Um, we live in Forest Grove, Anthony, uh, and I'm, I'm in touch with our, our senators, Chuck Riley and Susan McLean as our representative. Um, so I called both of their offices um, to see if I couldn't get either them, which would be ideal, or one of the representatives to come out to our demonstration at OLCC on Wednesday at 9.30 a.m. Don't know that that's going to go at all. You know, it's between, you know, how staffing and all of that. Right. But to drum up the interest, and particularly at Susan McLean's office, had a great deal of interest in why is this happening. And I told her in a nutshell, uh, you know, in the kindest, most loving way, I appreciate their, their service. Salem, you created this. You created this with the laws and the regulations and the fees, running blind and doing this. So my qu I, have, I have two questions, Anthony. Actually, uh, one, uh, one is, love to hear you guys talk about talking points on this issue right now that we're, that we're going to demonstrate on, um, but in general, because the two of you, and particularly Anthony, you're always working with the legislature and thinking in terms of how, how to present things simply, concisely, so that people can grasp it. And the other thing that I would ask, um, what was my other question? Um, shoot, I can't even think, my other question. Um, um, to talk more about what this rule means, this one ounce. Now, for most people, it's only being able to buy one ounce in a day. But I guess this just goes more to talking points. I had something else I wanted to ask you guys to talk about too. Well, talking remember. points is a very good thing, and it's very good to keep in mind. And when you're dealing with the legislature or you're dealing with the um, uh, media and you, they've got a mic stuck in your front, think bullet points. What, what can I say in like 12 words? You Usually know? there's a limit. It's often three minutes. Do you think that will be yeah, a three-minute limit? And, and the and the thing to keep in mind about the time limits is you're sitting in front of a group of people that you're unfamiliar with. It's an unfamiliar sound surrounding. It can be very intimidating. But just take a deep breath and start reading your thing and stay focused on it. And I always encourage anybody that's going to go do any testifying to write it out, put it in big letters so you can read it, double space it so you can write in between it, and read it, to, read it out loud in front of a clock so you know where you're at. When you get to the end of this first page, you've gone through 94, 90 seconds. You get to the, where you're going to end, you're at two minutes. That's what you want to be. And just be confident in yourself. And um, Because when I get ready to testify, I'm walking around my house reading it, and it gives you a lot of time to, oh, that's not what I meant to say. And you stop and you go da, 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 and then you get your time down. But it's hard to feel comfortable when you're testifying and uh, uh, talking to the media. But just think bullet points. We will be putting out some bullet points, talking points for our event on Wednesday. And also uh, the event in Eugene on October 4th. I want to talk just a little bit about that because this is not a protest. This is a show of how many patients are really out there we want to demonstrate how many patients are out there and that we are concerned that our program won't be available anymore and the cannabis commission their meeting that they're having in october they're discussing in detail the report that they have to give to the legislature by february 1st and i can assure you it is going to be a very interesting conversation because we have OLCC that wants something, OHA that wants something, the patients that want something, the state that wants something. And, um, you know, I anticipate seeing a minority report or two, frankly, from this report. And then following that, the Cannabis Commission is going to listen to patients. So what we're going to provide is red and green signs for that commission meeting. And if 
the people don't like so it. So you'll have some signs on Wednesday morning. Yeah. Is that what you're saying? We'll okay. have, well, the, also, f but more But people can bring their own signs. Yes, but. people can bring your own signs. Go to the Compassionate Oregon Facebook page. We got our top five things. Restore our 24. Don't penalize patients. OLCC is not safe for patients. There's five of them. And uh, just use one of those. It's all, uh, or, but we want to make sure that we're polite. And if we don't want to block traffic, we want to use a sidewalk. If we can get some people along McLaughlin so that they can see because there's an island of grass between the final parking lot before you get to McLaughlin that's got vision, sight lines and stuff. So um, to the door. To the door, yeah. Yeah, it's very safe. It's very I, I went safe. there and had a press conference, I think it was 1995 when we were kicking off our OCTA campaign right there. At that point, we would have put it under the OLCC. Uh, they weren't very receptive to it. But... Uh, <laughs> If you have a question for Anthony or myself and you're watching on the 14th of September, Friday night here in the Northwest, you can call us at that number there on your screen. It's 503-288-4442, and we do have a caller standing by. Welcome to the show, caller. Yes, uh, I have a question. Uh, I'm a senior citizen, and I'm on Social Security. I just barely am making it. And uh, I do smoke pot for pain. Uh, the doctors will not let me have any uh, pain medicine. How can I get a, a medical license? Uh, can't afford one. Are you uh, on any kind of like food stamps or anything? Yes, I am. So a person with food stamps uh, is able to pay a $50 annual fee to get that permit. And if you need help, uh, if your doctor won't help you signing that, then we have doctors we can refer you to. You can call our referral number in our office anytime, right now even, call that number there on your screen, 503-235-4606. That's 503-235-4606. They have various uh, low cost fees, I'm a, a veteran, a disabled veteran myself, but all veterans qualify for a $20 fee, as do people who re receive Social Security's Supplemental Security Income, or SSI. They qualify for a $20 fee from the state. Uh, for people on the Oregon Health Plan, then they qualify for a $60 fee, and if you're on the food stamps program, then it's a $50 fee. Otherwise, it's a $200 annual fee to get that permit. Yeah, I still can't afford that. Okay. No, well, well if you are on a, you know, if you're on SNAP, then you can get it for uh, 50 bucks, and uh, that's your best route. Uh, are you on the Oregon Health Plan? $20. Yes, I am. Well, sometimes the Oregon Health Plan physicians will sign your uh, 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 attending physician statement you just got to ask, and if they'll sign it, you can get a card for $50. Yeah, yeah a state fee of $50. Yeah, but, you know, I can't afford that. I understand. I know. Uh, so I All I can do is tell you what it is. I can't, I can't change um, the fees. I think that it should be as low as possible. But. The Patient Access Subcommittee is talking about this very issue where you just can't qualify uh, because of money or because of no address, you know, you just you're out on the streets, but you need cannabis. Um, and so we're talking about that. Uh, part of the issue is some of the homeless uh, programs that are available uh, to the indigent populations. Uh, they have very strict substance abuse clauses in their service agreements and uh, and in an order to get into a facility for the a shelter for the night you can't be a substance user and all these sorts of things so we're working on that one of our recommendations and cannabis is a substance i yes. take it right and what about so, tobacco is tobacco a substance under there? not one that they worry about i see, um, I see. so anyway we're working on that issue what we're trying to do is create a situation where any medical cannabis patient no matter their income, no matter how much they paid for their card, will qualify for supplemental patient access, which means they go in, they pay a $10 copay, and they can pick from what's available. The other thing that we're trying to make the state understand is that just because there's a million pounds of flour in the system doesn't mean that's what's going to help patients. Sometimes flour doesn't help patients. 
So um, what we're uh, seeking to implement is a full spectrum of medicines that are available in these supplemental patient programs because some of the patients are using the patients are using different modality systems. Some are using suppositories, some are using patches, some are using tinctures and oils. So um, that's part of it. And then the other thing we're trying very hard to do is, is, and actually the OLCC is receptive to this, but for the state to begin subsidizing the supplemental patient access programs. You know, I know that you've been meeting at the Oregon Cannabis Commission for about, uh, well, since last December. And so we have some footage uh, from the OCC from your May 21st meeting that we're going to roll right now, talking about that excess and the, the issues around diversion. And we'll be talking to you about this right after this clip. I hope you enjoy this. Okay, so when it, with respect to OLCC cultivators and overproduction, um, and I was on, you know, in the meeting about the canopy bump up and all that stuff, which sort of doesn't make sense to me when we have an overproduction problem. Um, so are there any recommendations to, the, you know, legislatively or to the OLCC with how to manage the overproduction within that system that could easily go to patients? So OLCC will be working on a comprehensive report on production in our regulated system, and that will be delivered uh, towards the end of this calendar year. Uh, as far as recommendations, uh, you know, I, I think really we have a wide open playing field as far as recommendations on how OLCC licensees could interact with patients and how they could subsidize the needs of patients. Uh, right now, uh, there are ways for people to do it lawfully if they choose to do it lawfully. Um, but we don't really have, except for the bump up canopy, um, which has been really not used um, effectively, we don't have any incentives written into the law um, to, to incentivize uh, redirecting surpluses to patients. Where are the surpluses going now? Same place they're going on the medical system. Okay. So, yeah, I, yes, that was a rhetorical question. Um, I think there, there probably are easy solutions. And I, don't, I never thought the bump of canopy was an appropriate solution. You know, why, why, why have licensees buy into more overproduction and then get to sell just a small port? None of that made sense to me when we already have overproduction as a problem. So let's try to capture that and reroute it to patients yeah, they, lawfully. I mean, I, I don't disagree with you. I've, I've spoken with some people in the industry uh, who are doing this charitably. Um, there's mechanisms for doing it charitably. Um, I don't think that there has been, based on just my anecdotal observations, I don't think there's been too much of that type of activity happening. I think there could, do, could be more. And, uh, you know, potentially the state could, could find a way to incentivize that activity. Uh, Anthony here, uh, to incentivize it, one thing that came out of our subcommittee was making um, a certain level of donation a requirement to get your medical endorsement through OLCC. And then the other thing I just want to touch on, there's 45,000 patients in this state. Um, that means that the maximum they can produce is 270,000 plants. The formula that OLCC used to convert plants canopy was a 40 square foot per plant. If you figure that out, that's about 10 million square feet divided by an acre. Shows that the patients are growing about 270 acres of cannabis in this state. So that's about what's licensed right now. So if the retail producers are producing a million pounds, medical growers are going to be close. The medical growers will be close to that number. Um, and since the state has basically shut off their market until they can get into OLCC metric system and try to, trans try to transfer up to 20 pounds, um, and there's just a lot of product out there that we've got to figure out how to make work for patients. 
one other data point I'd like to add to this discussion, uh, which is not directly related to this right now, but. Uh, you know, they talk about this surplus, and some people think that it's just sitting in some state warehouse somewhere. <laughs> but, in fact, it's an asset for all the growers, the processors, the, the distributors, and the dispensaries. It's split among all of them, That's probably right. a couple thousand different license holders. And 67% of it's sitting on their shelves. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's just they can't sell it. They can't sell it. And so the issue is then, well, what about all those patients? Let's give each one of them 40 patients two pounds. Mm -hmm. Well, the state just doesn't know. Who's going to pay the that. people that produced it for that? That's correct. Right? And so that's what we're working through on our patient access subcommittee is how we're going to make this program work. And we've come upon an answer, uh, and it's a solution that is um, not that novel, but it it's a different solution than what OMMP used when fees were coming in by the hundreds of thousands of dollars, mm -hmm. right? Well, At there's one still point, like 55%, right? I mean, there were 77,000 patients, and now, now they're down to like 39,000 yeah, or something. Yeah, just under 40,000, that's correct. And those numbers won't support the program. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So by 2021, this program is going to be in severe problems, trouble. So we're asking that the state because we made this mistake with the OMMP fees, right? We were paying for the program at 7 to $8 million a year. We were subsidizing six other OH program, OHA programs at about the same amount every year. And the state was coming through every year and sweeping 2 to $3 million off that was extra. So they're, so they're having money, the sick and dying medical yes. marijuana patients fund health care yes. for everyone else. Yes, and so now those six programs are no longer funded from our fees. Mm -hmm. They are funded from general fund and other little pockets of cash. But what needs to happen now is that the program itself needs to be funded not on patient fees anymore. And so the mistake we made was reallocating all that extra money. So we didn't get a research center 10 years ago. We didn't get, um, you know, uh, oversight of the grow sites and help with all that sort of stuff at that time and now we don't have the money to do it so our proposal is that don't make the same mistake we did and allocate all this money to other people we need 20 percent of the tax revenue right off the top to fund all cannabis programs to fund to subsidize supplemental patient access to the people that live in lakeview and give them you know, online ordering and subsidize regional delivery. And subsidize that, that guy who just called on his Social Security check. Absolutely. And he can't even afford the Fund $50. the research. Fund the research center. Um, Dr. Chu is uh, suggesting we create an Oregon Research Center for cannabis and ask him for $12 million to do it. And the program needs the money. So well, if they're making $40 million uh, a month in in sales it seems like the money 55 be million dollars oh, in recreational sales and about six million in medical sales mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so there's money to do it it's, over it's just that we all month. if if this going to happen if we're going to shave that top 20 percent off of that tax revenue for research for um the additional work that the cannabis commission is going to do funding the program and then supplementing um a patient access along with if an OMMP grower can get into OLCC, subsidize their cameras, mm -hmm. subsidize mm -hmm. them, and give them priority and get them in right away. They've been waiting a long time. So it's a big, big step, but what we're trying to push is what we're calling the, can the bottle bill of cannabis regulation. Well, we are down to four minutes left here. Uh, and so tell our viewers how they can reach your organization. Well, the best way to stay up with what we're doing is follow us on Facebook, Compassionate Oregon Facebook page. You can also go to our website, which is CompassionateOregon.org. And at both of those places, you can make a contribution to our organization, and we could use some of those right now. Um, so that's how you do it, and you can reach us at CompassionateOregon at Comcast.net. And That's an email, CompassionateOregon Oregon. at Comcast.net. Correct. And our number is 971, and it's up there. In microprint. In microprint. 971-241-2707. And one thing we've done What's that number again, Anthony? 971-241-2707. 
And um, so on the October 4th event, we're going to have a press conference. Senator Przanski is already committed to, um, to join us. That's um, in Eugene? In Eugene. Kimberly McCullough from the ACLU, Dr. Knox, will join us. And um, so we got a lot of stuff happening, and then we're going to have a Veterans Day I would go Day down, event. but I'm going to be in Madison, Wisconsin, for the 48th annual Great Midwest Marijuana Harvest Fest. I first went with that with John Sajo back in 1988, <laughs> and I gave my first big speech uh, at a rally there in 89. Right on. So it's the right oldest on. marijuana the event oldest, that's in right. the country, the Great Midwest Marijuana Harvest Fest in yeah. Madison, Wisconsin. So again, Compassionate Oregon at Comcast.net, and that's the great. phone number? 971-241-2707. Oh, one other thing, in Eugene, we've got flyers out to all the dispensaries. We sent them an info packet so you can tell friends in Eugene to go to the local dispensaries. We haven't hit Springfield, Vanita, Cottage Grove yet, but just in the city of for Eugene. Eugene, for sure, you can pick up information on uh, when, where, and how, and what we're going to do. Well, I want to thank you for coming on again, Anthony. I hope we have you back again uh, sometime soon. You're welcome anytime especially if you have some event or something happening. Appreciate and it. And I'm, I'm real interested to see what happens with uh, your report to the legislature and these uh, entities out there. I want to thank you guys for watching. We'll be back with another live show next week on the 21st. If you need help finding a doctor, we have a physician referral service to help medical marijuana patients, not just in Oregon, but all around the country. Uh, give us, if you have any of those conditions, then, uh, or you have a loved one that does, then we'll be happy to help you. Just call us, that number that just popped up on your screen there. That's our office, 503-235-4606. You can leave a message there 24 hours a day. If you have any other questions about marijuana policy, call us at that number. Thanks for watching. Here's Mr. John Cornett. Tune in next week and help us restore him. Raise the patient voice. That you too. know, it was the Thanks, Paul. medical patients that launched our movement for the liberation of cannabis. Okay, it was medical patients. It wasn't just a bunch of gangsters wanting to get high. It's a sunny day. Kids love to play. It's a sunny day Why can't it always be a sunny day? And I'm so happy not to see people getting hurt Stop hurting each other, thank you. <laughs>